together. Let's pray before we dig into God's Word. Oh Lord God, we are here because of you, not because of us. We come to you in prayer because of who you are. We know that you are able. We know that you are loving and gracious and kind. You are sovereign and you are on the throne. And God, we give you the place of God in our lives and the right to lead and be Lord. And so we surrender that to you, acknowledging who you are. Thank you, God, for your presence in our lives. As we uh, dig into your word this morning, would you make it come alive to us? And maybe even in a different way for every one of us, would you speak through your word? And even as we walk through a narrative, there are some incredible little nuggets of truth. And God, will you make those uh, grab us and move us and change us? So speak to us in the next few minutes. We commit this time to you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you have a Bible, turn to Nehemiah. We are in chapter 2, and the last couple of weeks we have been started our journey through this book. Uh, It'll last probably seven or eight weeks in total. If you weren't here a couple of weeks ago when we started in week one, let me really encourage you to go back and watch that video or listen to it on the podcast. Uh, It really sets the tone and, and, and the foundation for where we're going this whole time. But what we've looked at so far, the bottom line is that God gives his vision and direction. Will they band together to make that happen? In the face of fractured relationships, opposition, in difficulty, in sin, in successes and failures, in good leaders, in bad leaders, in people, uh, people were people. Years and years they had to straighten things out to accomplish God's vision for them. They were going to need to pull together to trust God, to trust their leadership, and to follow. They had to put their differences aside and pull together, and it took everybody. So what we've looked at so far is week one, we looked at the, the, the willingness to allow God to break our heart, to grip us. And not just to break our heart, but when God breaks our heart, to break our heart with the same things that break his heart. So our hearts are in tune and in alignment. And when that happens, how do we respond and what do we do? We saw last week that Nehemiah's response was to pray. And it wasn't pray and stop. It wasn't pray and do nothing. It was pray and wait. And for four months, he continued to pray. But he prayed and he listened, and he prayed and he planned, and he sought God desperately and was ready when the opportunity arose. And that's what we're going to see this morning. We looked at prayer last week and his posture in response to God breaking his heart, and that prayer starts with God, with with who God is, and letting God be in control. So he prayed persistently interceding. He prayed and he waited and he persisted. And in four months, as soon as God opened the door, he was ready. So if we go to chapter 2 of Nehemiah, we see right away here the first thing is, this is the day that God opens the door. And as I said, it's been four months since God gripped him and pointed him and he began to pray. So let's, let's start looking at... Um, chapter 2. We're going to look at chapter 2 and 3 today. I'm not going to read it all, but there's little chunks I'm going to read and and kind of make comments as we go along. In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was before him, I took up the wine and gave it to the king. Now, I had not been sad in his presence, and the king said to me, why is your face sad, seeing you are not sick, and nothing This is nothing but sadness of the heart. Then I was very much afraid. A lot of really interesting things there, even if we just stop there. Look at Artaxerxes. He's he's a powerful king. 
with a huge kingdom. They had taken over Babylon, which was a world power. And he's sitting as king of Persia. We don't know lots about Artaxerxes. We know lots about Xerxes, the king before him. But we see here something really interesting because it, I don't know if you think the same thing, but here's a king and he's surrounded by his attendants and it says here in a minute, his queen is beside him and his cupbearer comes in and brings him wine and instead of taking the kingly posture of I am the king and you are my servant, he is interestingly aware of this man and what's going on in his life. He sees and he's sensitive to it. And um, we really see almost a caring heart, a soft heart. His radar for people is on. It's hard to imagine a powerful king doing, uh, doing this, what we see here. The king says, why is your face sad, seeing as you're not sick? This is nothing but the sadness of the heart. Well, what's Nehemiah's response? And I, then I was afraid. Verse 3 and 4. And I said to the king, Let the king live forever. Why should my face not be sad when the city of the palace, the place of my father's graves, lies in ruins and the gates have been destroyed by fire? Then the king said to me, What are you requesting? I like that next phrase. So I prayed to the God of heaven. We know these kind of prayers well, right? We're terrified, we're in the moment, we're backed up against the wall. All of a sudden, right now, it's like, ah, what's our prayer? Maybe it's one word, help. The quick, fast prayer. Uh, one of the things I think what we'll do by the time we come to the end of this series, when we get to the end of Jeremiah, maybe we'll wrap up the whole series just looking at his prayers. Because I think there's 12 times in this book where he's, he stops and he prays. And, and they're all very different. And a lot can be learned from. Maybe we'll come back to that at one point. But Verse 5. And I said to the king, If it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in your sight, that you send me to Judah, to the city of my father's graves, that I might rebuild it. If we rewind back to the beginning of chapter 1, what gripped him, what God broke his heart with, was that the city walls of Jerusalem were ruined. The whole city had been destroyed. They had already, many had gone back and they had rebuilt the altar. They had rebuilt the temple. Uh, they were living there, but the walls were still destroyed and a lot of the city was in rubble. But a lot of the people had stayed in Persia. And Nehemiah, a hundred years after the people had first been released from their captivity, a hundred years later, he's still living in Persia. So he's never been to Jerusalem. Maybe he's been there, but he's never lived there. It's not his home. It's not his heart. But God gripped him with rebuilding this city. And when he prayed all the way through chapter 1, he never even talks about the walls of the city. And then here, as he's sad, he said he hadn't been sad in the king's presence before. But today, maybe something was different. And the king asked him, what is your request? His request is simply, can I go? Send me. There's probably a lot more he could have requested, but that was his request. And I love this because uh, the king's response to his servant, his attendant, is simply, uh, how long will you be gone and when will you return? Wouldn't it be great to have a boss like that? His sensitivity and his awareness he, we don't know whether, did he really, really like Nehemiah? Did they have a unique relationship? Or was he just this kind of kind-hearted, good man? We don't know any of that stuff. How long will you be gone? When will you be back? And then verse 7, And I said to the king, If it pleases the king, let letters be given to the governors of the province beyond the river, that they may let me pass through until I come to Judah. And the letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he might give me timber to make beams for the gates of the fortress of the temple and for the wall of the city and for the house that I will occupy. And the king granted me what I asked for the good hand of my God was upon me. I want to mark that last phrase. Uh, as we go through this, we're going to see something come up three or four or five times. 
And this phrase is key. And so we'll, we'll stick that up there and it'll be up there for a while. We'll add to that list because God was with him. So once he knew, it says, once he knew the favor of the king was with him, he came back with the answer of how many days he would be away and what that plan was. He didn't do anything spontaneous. I think he knew exactly what he was going to do, what the plan was. I think for four months as he prayed, God had broken all of it out for him and he waited patiently for the time the king opened the door and when he knew the king's favor was on him, he asked. He asked for letters for safe passage. He had to go through rival enemy territory to get there. So he asked for letters for passage. And we'll see in a second, when he traveled, the king sent an entourage of soldiers and horsemen with him. But he also asked for the timber, the the supplies, and the resources. So here he is, as God has broken his heart with what God wants to do. God has given him the vision and the dream and the drive, the fire inside him to see it happen. But then all of a sudden, God gives him the connections and the resources and the permits, and and everything he needs to make this happen. Why, verse 8? Because the hand of God was on him. That's key to this story. His request was granted because God was with him. And I wonder how often we're just afraid to ask. Maybe we're just afraid to ask, and we know this is what God wants, but we kind of simmer on it, and we don't go forward, and the door even opens. And maybe we do it, but we don't ask. And, and maybe sometimes God has the resources and the permits and the people and everything all lined up. I thought about that this week, and I thought, you know, a year ago, when we were talking about expanding this building, we are landlocked. And we knew there was five lots to the south of us for sale. And we knew the gentleman, and many of you know him, who owned those lots. And it was when Mel and I went to visit him in his home, and Mel said to him, uh, this is what we're, we'd like to do, here's our plan, uh, we would like to, to work on something with those lots, that he donated those lots to us. He donated them. And, and as the story rolls out later, I think, I've never confirmed this with him, I think that was his plan all along. That he had them for sale, hoping that we would ask. And he gave it to us when we asked. What if if we had never asked him? What if Nehemiah had never asked for this for the king? So he heads out. Verse 9, he heads out with an entourage of the king's soldiers. He's got the letters. He's got the permits. He's got the resources all in hand. And we quickly find that there's some opposition. And I came to the governors of the province beyond the river and gave them the king's letter. Now the king had sent me with officers of the army and with horsemen. But when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite servant heard this, get this phrase, it de- displeased them greatly that someone had come to seek the welfare of the people of Israel. They were bent out of shape because someone had a heart to help the Israelite people. If we flipped back over to the book of Ezra that corresponds in a lot of ways, we'll see that these guys and others appealed to the king, Artaxerxes, to have the work on the city halted. And it had been halted. And it was almost 10 years that nothing had been built by the king's order. And so here, here's Nehemiah coming to these people in these same countries, these same governors, with letters to have this rebuilt. That would have not only confused them, but probably angered them. We finally ground this to a halt. What's going on here? Well, who are these guys? There's two of them. We're going to see them throughout the entire rest of the book of Nehemiah. Uh, Sanballat the Horonite. Uh, The Horonites were living just north of Jerusalem. They were, uh, Sanballat was the chief political opponent to Israel, to Jerusalem, to this building. And some say, some other documents say that he was the governor of Samaria. Now, we know the Samaritans. The Samaritans were just outside Jerusalem. They were the half-breeds. They were Israelite people who had intermarried with other races. And so for the Israel people, the pure Israel people, they were worse than the lowest. They were worse than dogs. You didn't even talk to them. 
And that's how they treated them. And so these people, living just outside Jerusalem, they worshipped God. But they were excluded from access to the temple and access to even conversations with other Israels because they had... Um, because they had intermarried. And I, this, this was still going on in the day of Jesus. I love how Jesus respected and interacted with these people. Jesus' people, the Israelites, refused to even talk to them. And Jesus went to them and called them and ministered to them and served them. Well, um, according to Josephus, historian, Sanballat, this guy, built a rival temple in Samaria. So the Samaritans had a place to worship on their own. And, and maybe, maybe I can understand a little bit their opposition to, to Israel getting rebuilt. Because they had been pushed aside, they had been squashed continually and treated so poorly that maybe, maybe Israel sitting in ruins was a little bit of retribution for them. So if that's the case, then we can see a little bit of his, his disappointment, his frustration with anybody trying to help Israel. But the other guy, Tobiah, different story completely. It says he's an Ammonite servant. And, and my question is, was he? Was he a servant as we think of a servant? Because he's hobnobbing with the governors from these surrounding countries. And so I looked at that a little bit, and I found out that uh, some historians say that he was a freed slave. So he had been a slave. Other historians say that he was a public servant. And that word that's in, the, in our Bible here that's servant is just as appropriately translated a public servant. So he could be a government worker or a public servant in that sense. So we don't know any of that and maybe it doesn't even matter. The interesting thing here about this guy is he married the daughter of the high priest in Jerusalem. So he's a guy who is right in the middle of the Israel, Israelite nation. He's family to the core, to the high priest. And he becomes one of the biggest opposers to anything happening. How much harder is it for us when our opposition comes from our own family? He's buddy-buddy here with the wrong crowd. And his family are people that are building this wall. And he is loud and active opposition all the way along. That phrase, it, disple it di displeased them that anybody would seek welfare of Israel. Where do we leave off? Verse 11. So I went to Jerusalem and was there for three days. And I rose in the night, I and a few men with me, and I told no one what God had put into my heart for Jerusalem. Let me stop there again. Let's add that, fra that phrase to our list up here. Here he is, we've told this whole story how God has broken in his heart and driven him forward. How God has put the resources and the permits and per permission, everything around him. And he travels there and he's there and he gets up and he has not told anyone yet what God put on his heart to do. That's a key phrase that, that we'll come back to again in a minute. There was no animal with me but the one I rode. And I went out by night by the valley gate to the dragon spring and to the dung gate, and I inspected the walls of Jerusalem that were broken down and its gates that had been destroyed by fire. And I went on to the fountain gate to the king's pool, and there was no room for the animal that was under me even to pass. And I went up by night by the valley and inspected the wall, and I turned back and entered by the valley gate and so returned. And the officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing, and I had not yet told the Jews, the priests, the nobles, the officials, or the rest who were there to do the work. So he's there for three days. And uh, he goes out and he surveys the need. He looks at everything. He looks at the walls that are broken, the gates that are destroyed, the rubble. He gives kind of, in a sense, the State of the Union address. He looks at the cost and the needs. And he does all of this serious work and he hasn't told anybody yet what's going on or why he's there. I love the idea of these alone uh, walkabouts. Walking around to check it and see. Uh, he walks and he prays and he looks and he turns over stones. He takes notes. The leader 
had it all together before he went public. Would you not expect that from a leader? The prayer, the plan, the materials, the needs analysis, even identifying the opposition, it was all ready. He knew clearly that this plan was from God. And he knew clearly that it took thorough, diligent leadership if they were going to do this. Now here's a key. That the leader knows that it's God that's driving this. Those leaders need clearly to communicate that it's all God. That it's his plan and his fire, his broken heart. And these folks need to see that this is God and God's plan. Now, we could go all the way through the book of Nehemiah and just look at leadership. Page after page after page, uh, it's a gold mine for leaders. But there's a key phrase here in verse 12. What God put into my heart to do. If Nehemiah had just kept that to himself, that part, I don't know if this thing would have happened. We'll see that in the next little bit here. Go to verse 15. And I went up by night in the valley and inspected the walls. I turned back and entered the valley, through the valley gate, and so I returned. And the officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing. I had not yet told them. I hadn't told the Jews, the priests, the nobles, the officials, and the rest who were to do the work. Verse 17. Then I said to them, You see the trouble we are in, how Jerusalem lies in ruins with gates burned. Come, let us build the wall of Jerusalem, that we may no longer suffer derision. If he had stopped there, what would have been the response of the people? Think about this. Here's a guy who uh, is a Jew, but has lived in another country. And we've been living here the whole time. And he travels over here, looks at the walls, and says, wow, the walls are down. Let's build it. My first response is, well, who are you to to lead us. Why would you come? Um, They didn't know who he was or the backstory or any of this. What if he had come with all of the permits and everything and said, come on, folks, let's do it. Are you in? Who are you to come and mess with our lives? It's been like this for 10 years, 20 years. Actually, it's been like this for almost 200 years. So the question for us is, as we read it looking back, was it clear that God moved Nehemiah into this? I think it absolutely is. So here's this guy from another country, a palace servant. God breaks his heart with what he wants him to do. He gives all the right connections, the right person, the right skills, the right passion, and he knew it was all from God. And he started by going to God patiently in prayer. He puts himself right where God wants him to be, waits for God's timing, uses all the right relationships and the right resources and puts it all together. And before Nehemiah even took to the road, he knew the God of heaven will make us prosper. We are his servants and we will rise and build. But what about the others, the ones who lived in the rubble? They don't know him. He's not from there. He doesn't know their struggles. He doesn't know the way they've been living for a number of years. He's from a foreign king's palace. All of this stands against him coming in and leading. He's coming in here and changing everything. Maybe even don't tell us what to do. We can handle it ourselves. Go back to your cushy job in the enemy's palace. All of that unless... Unless the people actually see that God has been crafting this for months. God himself worked the heart of Nehemiah. They needed to see that. God himself worked the heart of Artaxerxes. They needed to see that. God himself chose and anointed him and brought him from afar off. They needed to know that. And they needed to be just as confident in God's part of this story as he was. So what did we see as we've studied it so far? We've seen the two building blocks that, of the heart that's willingly broken by God. And prepared spiritually, earnestly seeking God. 
with a humble and contrite heart. And we're coming to the third thing. You can probably guess what it is by looking at the screen. When he called them to build in verse 17, it was all about the great need. But look at verse 18. And I told them of the hand of my God that had been upon me for good. You can add that to the list. I don't know if you can see the pattern happening here. It should be pretty obvious. And I told them of the hand of my God that had been upon me for the good, and also the words of the king that had spoken to me. And they said, let's rise up and build. They didn't say, let's rise up and build when somebody comes along and sees the walls are down and says, let's do it. But when they knew it was God, they said, let's do it. Let's rise up and let's build. But it wasn't all that easy because there's still some pushback to happen. Verse 19. And when Sambalat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite servant and Geshem, well, there's a third person now, Geshem the Arab heard about it, they jeered at us and despised us and said, What is this thing you're doing? Are you rebelling against the king? This goes back to the king's edict to stop building. They had put a stop to this, and here it was happening again. So they're trying to play now the king against them and say, well, you're rebelling against the king. And they mocked them and jeered them. So who is this third guy? Geshem the Arab. Interesting, Geshem, the word itself, the name means bulky. (laughs) Thank you, Dad, for naming me bulky. Right, And he's from Arab, and and he's the ruler of Kedar, which is to the east of Jerusalem. And his people had sort of moved in and settled and living in the ruins of Jerusalem while the people of Israel were in, in Babylon in exile. So he joins the opposition here, maybe because his country, his area, are now losing ground. A lot of my people are living here, and we're going to get pushed out. So he joins the effort against. These guys that opposed, why? They had personal passions? Was it just aggressive hate? Was it personal directions or desires or family? Did they think they were doing evil? Or did they think they were really doing what was right? Or was it just because this was going to mess up their plans? I don't know if any of that matters. We do know that even if they were trying to do the right thing, they were crossing God's plans. Verse 20, the God of heaven will make us prosper. That's his response to them. The God of heaven will make us prosper. We are his servants. We will arise and build, and you will have no portion or right or claim in Jerusalem. This is how he responds to them. No portion, no right, no claim in Jerusalem. They all had a portion of Jerusalem. They all had claims and rights there. But Nehemiah here was all in. He was deeply convicted. His heart had been gripped. He was pressed forward on what God had given him to do. And almost everybody was with him. Sadly, there's always people in opposition, right? Well, next week in chapter 4, 5, and 6, we're going to look a lot more at the opposition and how they mounted against them. But, but here, um, here we see that they are ready to do what God wants. And the key to that was they knew this was what God wants. So chapter 3, the building starts. And I'm not going to read through chapter 3. It just it starts at the, at the one part of the city near the temple and walks all the way around as, as it gives the plan for their building. But there's some interesting things through, as we look through this. Uh, the first to jump into action, chapter 3, verse 1, the first people that responded to and actually started building were the priests, the religious leaders. And, and interestingly, and I think unashamedly, they started at the place most important to them. The, the temple, uh, right outside the temple at the wall was what was called the sheep gate. And this is the part where, this is the place in the gate where the sacrificial sheep would come in from the pastures towards the temple to be sacrificed. And the altar and the temple had been rebuilt, but the sheep gate was still a mess. So the priests themselves went and started putting together and rebuilding the sheep gate. 
That was what was probably closest to their heart. It was the only part of the whole wall that was sanctified by the priests. So they started at the place that was the closest to their heart. Interestingly, the men of Jericho were the ones right beside them building the next wall. From there to the fish gate. The fish gate was one of the city's main gates. It was a main merchant entrance. And from the walls, from there to the next to the next, it says there was the family after family, shoulder to shoulder, building the walls. And then we come to verse 5, and there's an interesting twist. There's one phrase there that stands out in this whole chapter. This whole chapter is, these folks built this, these guys built this, these guys built this. They were shoulder to shoulder. But in verse 5, it says, and next to them were the, the Tekoites, and they repaired, but their nobles would not stoop to serve their Lord. How would you like to be the only people that go down in history that refused? They knew clearly this is what God wanted, but there were still people in there that refused. It was beneath them to do this. And as we read through this, we see that everybody, from the high priests to the goldsmiths to the to perfumers to the musicians, everybody was building on this wall except these one small group of people. In contrast to that, down in verse 10, or 14, sorry, the ruler of the district repaired the dung gate. Talk about the lowest of the lowest spots. And one of the rulers goes there and starts building there. This is the, the gate that all of the, the waste and the refuse, the human refuse, all of that would go out that gate because that couldn't stay in the city. The dump was out there. And so we're contrasted with some people who refused to stoop to even build and others that went right to the grossest place to start. I'm rem reminded of one of the first times I took uh, high school kids on a missions trip. And it was a group in Owen Sound. And some of you know Mark Dakin. He passed uh, just a, a month or two ago. And um, we were with this group here, and we went to a school. And it was disgusting. And we went to first to clean it, and we painted the entire school. And as we divvied out the jobs, there was one job that everybody was hoping they didn't get. And there was a sort of an outhouse latrine that was, uh, let me just say, it was the worst place you can imagine. And as we divvied out the jobs, it got left down. I don't know, I was calling out who was doing what, and I messed up. So it ended up with me and Mark Dakin heading off to that latrine. And it was disgusting. And as we worked there for the day, um, in the middle of it, Mark turned to me and said, you know what? This is the place where Jesus would start. So, wow, what insight from a high school kid. That makes me think of that when I think of the dung gate. And then the people who wouldn't even do the work. Huh. This was not, this is the part most important to me. This is the servant's heart saying whatever needs to be done. And then they, clean, they did the fountain gate, which irrigated the royal gardens and connected to the pool of Sela, the water gate, no nicks and jokes, the horse gate, the east gate, the muster gate, and all the way back to the sheep gate. So they surrounded the whole city. So what is my point? Aside from going through a nice historical narrative, this is a great picture of God's people coming together. In this list, there isn't a whole lot of opposition. But I'm sure it happened. They were people. There always seems to be people who stand in the way. But what was the theme continuing through this narrative? I hope you saw it. What we see here is critically important. God's people, compelled by God's vision... Seeing God's provision, follow God's plan. Everyone in his place, everyone doing his part. Let me translate that into 2017 for a minute. If I asked you, what does God want us to do? God's vision, God's direction. Where have we seen God provide in the last year? 
Where have we been compelled by God's heart? Maybe the answers to those two questions are the same answer. I know that I could name a whole lot of things. But once Nehemiah's heart was gripped by God, he was willing to give up living in the palace to see God's vision become reality. And he actually couldn't do anything other. His cause, the cause was bigger than him. The cause was bigger than their differences. It was bigger than his own dreams and successes. So God gave the vision. Will the people pull together and make it happen? So far, so good. Almost everybody responded. So the building block we saw first was a heart that was willing to be broken by God with the same things that break God's heart. The second building block was prepared and positioned through patient prayer. What is this building block? Is it a leader who steps up? It could be. Is it not about leadership? Is it about following? And actually, all the way through Scripture, all of us are called to be followers. Probably more than we're called to be leaders. We're called to be followers. Here it is. God's people, compelled by God's vision, seeing God's provision, following God's heart. What is it that God wants to do? Am I on board? Are we on board? Who's going to be the one group that goes down as the ones who wouldn't join in? The Tekoite nobles. They were on board because God was with them. Because they saw God at work. And I think they were willing to recognize that God's plan was God's plan. They, they were tuned in to what God was up to. They listened to God and do what he says. And that's not any more leader, not any more important for the leaders than it is for all of us. What, is it, what does it mean for us to be a beacon of hope on the shores of Lake Huron? Does that mean we have a great building with a lighthouse on it and as people drive by they see our sign and they go, wow, a church, there's hope. That's got nothing to do with that. What it's about is us. As we engage in people's lives, as we listen to God and obey, as we actually get doing things in our world and engaging with people, like Winterfest yesterday, as we engage with these people, we can become a beacon of hope. In the last 10 days, two people have surrendered their lives to Jesus Christ for the very first time because of some of you folks. And the way you've engaged in their lives transparently and shared with them. And maybe what we need to do is like Nehemiah arrived and rode around the city assessing. Maybe there's three things we do that. Maybe we need to ride around our towns and say, what needs to be done? What is God's plan? What is God up to? What is God asking us to do? Maybe we need to ride around our church. What is God calling us to? What is God's dream? What does God want from us? What, what, is, what are the needs? Maybe we need to just simply ride around in our lives and do that same thing. What is it that God is breaking your heart with? Do we have the courage to do it? But the truth is, as we've listed on the screen the whole way through here, this is because God's hand is at work. This is because God has given his plan. This is because God is with us, and we are his people. And when we're sure of that, we bind together, and we accomplish what God wants us to do. Let me tell you a story, uh, and I'll pray. I know our time is up. In India, uh, I'm told about a place that is uh, a little family business that makes the finest wedding saris that are available. And this is just simply a seamless, long, one-piece cloth that wraps around the bride, around and around, in the proper way until she's properly covered. But the wedding sari is fabulous. And it's gorgeous cloth with colors and gold woven through it into a fantastic pattern. And this place, I understand, makes the best of the best. And it's so simple. Incredibly simple. It's a father and a son, and that's all that's there. 
at the one end of, of the, the, the machine, the, 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 the loom, I guess, sits the father. And in his hand, he has all of the different threads. At the other end of the machinery is the son. And all he does is slide the piece of wood back that way and back that way and back that way. Simply, just sitting there, the two of them make the best, most elaborate designs available. The father has the pattern in his head. He controls what thread goes where and how they intertwine. He is the one that calls out all of the shots. With a simple nod of his head, he gives the timing instructions to his son to slide the thing across and back. The dad moves his head and nods. Or the dad moves his hands and nods. The son moves his hands and nods. And the son's whole job is simply to respond to the dad's nod. How simple. Now, folks, is that not God's plan for us? It's God's plan for these people in the book of Nehemiah. It's God's plan for us. And, and I've got to say, just in closing, that he... Our board is in the middle of some fantastic dreams for 2017. We believe God has given us vision and direction and clarity. And a year from now, it will be brilliant to look back on 2017 and say this. God's people, compelled by his vision, seeing God's provision, following God's heart. What does verse 8 say? For the hand of my God was upon me. And verse 20, the God of heaven will make us prof- prosper because we, will his, we are his servants. Let me pray. Father, we just dug into a long narrative. Thank you that it is your fingerprints all over it from beginning to end. It starts with you moving the heart of a man. It starts with you moving the heart of another man and bringing them together in relationship at the right time with the right question to spark an entire city gathering around to fulfill your will and your dream of rebuilding and reestablishing your city and your people. God, may we follow that same template that you would grip our hearts, that we would hit our knees on the floor in prayer and patiently wait. God, you provide the connections and the resources and the permits and the building materials and the planning because this is your plan and we will prosper because you are at the control of this like the father in the weaver. The, the weaver. God, may we simply respond to your nod and the move of your hand. But like in this story, God, we want to see it. We want to know it. We want to see you active. We want to see, and so we can respond, and so we can know. So God, would you allow us the opportunity to see through your eyes, to see what you are doing, to see your dreams, your plans, compel us together in unity to accomplish your will and your dream for us and for our towns. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand.